All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I have quite a bit to pass along today, so appreciate your patience, and we'll get right to your questions. Uh, first, let me start off by offering the department's deepest condolences to the families of our five U.S. Marines assigned to Marine Heavy Helicopter Squadron 361, Marine Aircraft Group 16, 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing, who died in a helicopter crash February 6 in California. As Secretary Austin said in his statement this morning, we mourn their tragic loss and his prayers are with these brave Marines, their families, loved ones, and teammates. We will forever be grateful for their call to duty and selfless service. And we also wanna thank the multiple local, state, and federal agencies who are assisting with recovery operations. As a matter of policy, identities of deceased service members will not be released until 24 hours after all next of kin notifications have been completed. For additional questions, I would refer you to the Marine Corps. Separately, Secretary Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General C.Q. Brown Jr. Jr. will travel to Brussels, Belgium next week to host an in-person meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group on February 14. This will be the 19th meeting of the UDCG since Secretary Austin formed the international group in April 2022. The Secretary and Chairman will join Ministers of Defense and senior military officials from nearly 50 nations to discuss the ongoing crisis in Ukraine and the continued support from the international community to provide the Ukrainian people with the means necessary to defend their sovereign territory. While in Brussels, Secretary Austin will also participate in the NATO Defense Ministerial February 15 at NATO headquarters. Turning to the Middle East, as U.S. Central Command announced yesterday at 9.30 p.m. Baghdad time, February 7, U.S. Central Command forces conducted a unilateral strike in Iraq in response to the attacks on U.S. service members, killing a Qatub Hezbollah commander responsible for directly planning and participating in attacks on U.S. forces in the region. There are no indications of collateral damage or civilian casualties at this time. Additionally, initial assessments indicate that there were no additional militants injured or killed beyond the one Qatub Hezbollah commander who was targeted. Additionally, CENTCOM continues to assess the results from our earlier strikes in Iraq and Syria on February 2, but initial indications are that over 40 militants associated with Iranian proxy groups were killed or injured in the U.S. strikes against seven facilities, which included more than 85 targets that Iran's IRGC and affiliated militias have used to attack U.S. forces. As we made clear, the United States will continue to take necessary action to protect our people, and we will not hesitate to hold responsible all those who threaten the safety of our forces. Separate and distinct from the U.S. strikes in Iraq and Syria are the multinational actions we took on February 3rd as part of ongoing international efforts to respond to increased Iranian-backed Houthi destabilizing and illegal activities in the region. As you recall, coalition forces targeted 13 locations, striking 36 Houthi targets associated with the Houthis' deeply buried weapons storage facilities, missile systems and launchers, air defense systems and radars, all capabilities Houthi militia have used to attack international merchant and naval vessels in the region. These strikes were intended to further disrupt and degrade Houthi capabilities to conduct their attacks against U.S. and international vessels lawfully transiting the Red Sea. CENTCOM continues to evaluate the February 3 strikes, but initial assessments indicate that 35 targets at the 13 locations were destroyed or functionally damaged. The targets destroyed include command and control sites, weapons storage, missile systems, UAV storage, and operations sites, radars, and three helicopters. More broadly, since the first coalition strikes on January 11, we assess that we've destroyed or degraded more than 100 missiles and launchers, including anti-ship, land attack, and surface-to-air missiles, plus numerous communication capabilities, unmanned aerial vehicles, unmanned surface vessels, coastal radars, air surveillance capabilities, and weapon storage areas. I will repeat again that the U.S. does not want escalation and that these strikes are directly in response to the actions by the Iranian-backed Houthis. Again, however, we will not hesitate to defend lives and the free flow of commerce in one of the world's most vital waterways. Shifting to the Indo-Pacific, this week the U.S. military and the Japan Self-Defense Force conducted a bilateral command post exercise known as Keen Edge 24 with the participation of the Australian Defense Force. 
The exercise is the latest in a series of joint multilateral command post exercises designed to increase our integrated joint operational capability, refine command and control procedures, and enhance interoperability of all participants. This year's iteration of the Keen Edge exercise included greater synchronization with the U.S. Space Command and U.S. Cyber Command, expanding the multi-domain collaboration that is incumbent on any large-scale exercise or operation. And finally, as a status update on a topic that many of you been, have been asking about, the DOD Performance Improvement Officer and Director of Administration and Management and her team have completed their 30-day review of the Department of Defense notification process for when the Deputy Secretary or another designated official assumes the duties and functions of the Secretary of Defense. The review has been submitted to Secretary Austin and he is in the process of reviewing it. Uh, much of the report is classified since it relates generally to continuity of operations and the security of our personnel. However, as the Secretary has said, we remain committed to being as transparent as possible about the review and we'll have more information once the Secretary's review is complete. And with that, I'll be glad to take your questions. We'll go to Associate Press Lita Baldor. Thank you, Ted. <coughs> um, just a couple follow-ups on the strike. So you confirming that um, Al Saadi was the only person um, in the vehicle at the time and the only person killed, is that um, accurate what you're saying? That is correct. We, uh, we, are, we have uh, high confidence that that was the case. And then uh, you said, you mentioned 40 militants. Are th were those primarily um, KH militia that were killed, the 40 that you mentioned? Because I think there's been some statements that there was a belief that no Iranians have been <coughs> killed. Is that still the case? Uh, so, uh, you know, again, CENCOM continues to assess right now. We have no indications that Iranians were killed in these strikes. Um, I don't have a specific breakdown in terms of the particular uh, Iranian proxy militant group uh, other than to say, uh, again, our assessment is that, uh, you know, what I've read out to you. And then just on the review, just for, uh, uh, was that submitted today? And is there an expectation that there are any disciplinary actions recommended in this report or, or review, or is that something that comes later? Yeah, on, on that part, uh, I haven't seen the review, so I, I can't answer that question. Uh, again, we'll try to keep you updated on, on that front. Uh, to my knowledge, the report was submitted to the secretary uh, today. Okay, Jennifer. What evidence uh, does the Pentagon have that Kateb Hezbollah was behind the drone strike uh, that killed Americans in Jordan? Uh, well, as we said in our statement, uh, this, this commander uh, was responsible for directly planning and participating in attacks on U.S. forces in the region. So again, um, I'll just leave it at that, Jennifer. Were, was he directly involved in planning that attack on the Jordan base? Uh, I don't have any information on that. We are confident that he uh, was responsible for directly planning and participating in attacks on U.S. forces, of which there's been over 160, as you know. And did you um, tell the Iraqi prime minister or anyone in the Iraqi government ahead of this strike? So uh, we notified the Iraqis shortly after the strike occurred. Uh, I'm not going to go into any more details in terms of you know private diplomatic discussions. Um, we, of course, uh, fully respect Iraq's sovereignty uh, and have been very clear uh, in our public statements and private conversations uh, that we would respond at a time and place of our choosing when it came to holding uh, the groups that have been attacking U.S. forces accountable. And is your response over? Um, it, you know, as, as I said, uh, this strike that we did yesterday was in response to the continued attacks on, on U.S. forces. I'm not going to discuss or speculate about potential future operations other than to say that we will continue to take necessary actions to protect our forces. Let me go over here to Tom and then we'll go to... Uh, the 40 uh, militants killed or wounded, do you have a breakdown from Iraq and Syria? And also, any sense civilians were killed? The mayor of, of Al Qaim says one civilian was killed, five houses damaged. Are you guys looking into that? So, Tom, I don't, I don't have a breakdown for you, uh, Iraq versus Syria. Um, what I will say is that we are aware of allegations that at least one civilian was killed during the, the February 2 strikes, uh, which CENTCOM is reviewing. As you've heard us say, we will always take civilian harm mitigation very seriously. Uh, and take all possible precautions to minimize potential harms to civilian. But beyond that, I don't. That civilian killed in Al Qaim. Do you know where it was, that person was killed? I, I don't have that in front of me. So again, CENTCOM will review this, and uh, you know. And lastly, on the review, will that also look into the communications breakdown? What happened there? 
um, for the the 30 day review. Uh, so it will look at all the relevant facts associated with the notification process as it pertains to uh, transferring authorities from the the secretary to the deputy secretary. Again, that that memo is available online on the DoD website under the publications tab, and you can see exactly what the review uh, is calling for. Missy. Um, Pat, will the review be provided to Congress? Um, and if so, if, if, like, would that be in a classified format so they can review it in classified setting? Or will you wait and do a, some sort of unclassified version of that? And then going back to Iraq, do you have an update on the um, HMC process? Um, there's some reports that there's going to be a meeting in a few days. Yeah, thanks, Missy. So um, we'll certainly work to keep Congress informed about uh, the review. And, and so we'll keep you updated on that front. Again, at this stage, the, the Secretary just got it. So he's reviewing. But um, I'm confident. Uh, as we always do, we'll work with Congress to ensure they have uh, the information that they that they request and that they need. Uh, on the HMC, um, you know, we do remain committed to the HMC process. Um, I don't want to get into the specifics on how and when those private conversations will occur, other than uh, we again will will work with our Iraqi partners. Sorry, I forgot on that. to ask: is, Do you have any update on him potentially testifying before the? Um, Hask. Yes, the, the secretary uh, will testify uh, to the Hask on 29 February. And will that be an open hearing? Uh, I'd have to refer you to Congress on that piece. Okay, Dan. Could you give us an idea of how important Al Saidi uh, was uh, to uh, that militia group and to these attacks on U.S. forces? Uh, well, again, I'd, I'd point you to CENTCOM's press release. And as I highlighted, I mean, this was a commander who was responsible for directly planning and conducting attacks against U.S. forces. And so, uh, again, our, our focus uh, in Iraq and Syria is on the enduring defeat of ISIS. But when our forces are threatened, we will take appropriate action. And this strike was conducted in response to the attack uh, against our forces uh, as well as the attack on our base, our facility in Jordan, where three service members were killed and uh, numerous wounded. Could I just ask you about the Sea Stallion uh, crash? Um, were there, is there any indication at this point that weather versus mechanical failures might have been a factor? And also, were there any indications that the crew tried to land or just considered landing? before it went down. Yeah, thanks, Dan. I, I don't have any information on that. As you know, uh, in any type of uh, aviation accident or incident, there will be an investigation. And so it's very important to allow that investigation uh, to run its course before any, uh, you know, there's any discussion or speculation on, on what may have happened. So I'd, I'd encourage you to keep in touch with the Marine Corps and they can keep you updated. Secretary, is there a wider concern about aviation safety now? There's been so many mishaps. There's been reports indicating uh, problems with you know training a sufficient amount of training for both pilots and the maintenance crews yeah well I mean I can assure you that that we are dedicated to ensuring uh, that safety is in all of our programs to include our aviation programs we've taken critical steps to integrate industry best practices when it comes to evaluating training maintenance safety standards I can also assure you that that each of the services takes this very seriously as well uh, and so they will as always, continue to look at their training, maintenance, and safety programs to ensure that we learn from every incident and apply those lessons into their risk management programs and management of those fleets. Thank you. Fadi? Thank you, John. I just have one qu uh, clarification on the higher um, the military commission. There is a statement by Major General about, about the, the meeting on February 11. So is okay. the Pentagon confirming that or not? Uh, sure. I refer to that statement. Okay, cool. Okay, so my, <laughs> my, qu my question, I could have taken that question. My question <laughs> is, um, I have two, two questions. Um, this is the first time we hear uh, an official statement uh, naming uh, Abu Bakr al-Sadi. Uh, statement from CENTCOM just said commander, uh, said he is involved in this and that. I mean, why hasn't the Pentagon or the CENTCOM mentioned who the guy who was targeted, especially the Iraqi government is protesting what happened, targeting someone in a busy street, endangering civilians, according to their statement. And and there's, it seems there's a major disagreement between you and your partner in Iraq, and yet there's another commander, part of the, according to Iraq's PMF, that <coughs> been, who's been assassinated in Baghdad. And you're not sharing enough information to prove that he's involved in anything that uh, 
related to attacking U.S. forces. There was literally no question in that statement. I'm saying <laughs> why there was a question. You, in, even in your statement, you well, didn't mention his name until so you were asked was about Wassam Muhammad Sabir al Saidi was a Kitab Hezbollah commander who was responsible for directly planning and participating in attacks on U.S. forces in the region. Uh, he's not a member of the PMF. He's a Kitab Hezbollah commander. And we're very confident uh, in the um, process that we took in order to identify uh, and, again, hold this individual accountable. And then the, you said you, uh, you respect the sovereignty of the Iraqi government. The Iraqi government disagrees with that statement, uh, and it seems your action uh, run uh, opposite to that statement. When you uh, take military actions in a, in a sovereign nation, isn't that a violation of its sovereignty? Well, Fadi, uh, so first of all, again, we're in Iraq at the invitation of the government of Iraq to fight ISIS. And, and again, I, I know you know this, but for the benefit of, of those listening and watching, you'll recall uh, when we returned to Iraq uh, with significant numbers in 2014, it was to help them fight ISIS. Um, again, those forces are there to help train and advise in their fight against ISIS and help save Iraqi lives. We, the U.S. military, have an inherent right to defend ourselves if attacked. And again, publicly and privately, we've, been, we've made it very clear to our, our Iraqi partners uh, that we will take necessary action to defend those forces. Again, uh, I've served in Iraq. I've been there many times. Um, we have fought and died alongside Iraqis for many years to help them defend their nation. Uh, and the reason that we're there is, again, to help them to protect uh, their country against ISIS. But if we're attacked, we have a responsibility to defend our forces, and that's that's what we did. Let me go back over here to Oren, and then we'll go to Carl. Uh, two questions. First, was it by design that no Iranians were killed as the U.S. seeks to avoid open conflict with Iran? Uh, I'm not going to have anything to provide, Oren, beyond what I've already made in, uh, in my statement. And then second question, uh, General Maslum, the, the SDF commander, briefed reporters and said ISIS has taken advantage of the situation. Uh, frankly, the chaos in the region, to, and they have seen a spike in their activity. Has the U.S. seen that same spike? Does that does that mean more ISIS attacks? What does that does that mean the, the de-ISIS coalition has has effectively been busier? Uh, well, look, I mean, you know, it, part of this is uh, relative. Uh, when you want to start talking about ISIS and its presence around the world and, and around the region in terms of spike, certainly as we've seen before. You know, ISIS is insidious and will take advantage of ungoverned spaces and uh, opportunities to, you know, to exploit uh, tensions and fissures is what you see in places like, you know, just yesterday, I think there was an attack in Baluchistan by ISIS-K. You see them in Afghanistan. You see them uh, on the African continent. So uh, in Iraq and Syria, uh, they are down, but they're not out. And so, again this work by an international coalition continues to try to prevent a resurgence of ISIS. And so, again, we're, we're very focused on that, but it's obviously not helpful uh, when you have things like Iranian proxies attacking your forces that are there for that mission. But have you seen them, have you seen an increase in their activity in Iraq and Syria? I mean, they certainly conduct activities. I don't have any data in front of me right now to, to show. Um, but again, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. Carla. Thank you, Pat. Um, just to follow up, and then one question, but to follow up, you had mentioned about how U.S. forces have been working with Iraqis for years. This was the second time that the U.S. has struck inside of Iraq, of Iraq without letting the Iraqis know until after the strikes had occurred. Has there been some level of trust that's been lost between the United States and Iraq? Look, we, again, view Iraq as a very valued and important partner, uh, and we will continue to work and consult closely with them on regional security issues, supporting them, because again, we're there at their invitation. Um, in terms of notification uh, processes, you know, look, we're, we're going to take operation security and force protection into account into any operation. Um, but again, I just go back to what I've said, that we've been very clear publicly and privately that we'll take appropriate action to defend our forces. Let me go okay, to and then one on Ukraine, if I may. Sure. Um, Ukraine's uh, Alexander Sersky has taken over from Zaluzny as head of Ukraine's armed forces. Has Secretary Austin or um, General Brown spoken 
to Sersky yet? And does the Pentagon anticipate any changes in Ukraine's military strategy after this reshuffle? Uh, I, I can't speak for General Brown. Um, to my knowledge, uh, yeah, so I'd refer you to Joint Staff for that. Um, General Austin, General Austin, going back in time there. <laughs> uh, Secretary Austin uh, has not spoken to uh, the, the, you know, to that individual. Um, you know, obviously a lot of questions that, that we've received. Um, we're, we're aware, of course, of the reports uh, about uh, changes in the, in the Ukrainian armed forces. That's really something that I would have to refer you back to Ukraine to discuss their internal uh, discussions and, and decisions. Um, I can tell you the one thing that it won't change, and that is our continued support for Ukraine and their efforts to defend themselves against Russian aggression. So I'll just leave it at that. Laura. Thank you. Um, one on Iraq, Syria, and one on Ukraine. Um, is there an, has there been an increased threat since um, these attacks started to the detention centers in Syria, where, as you know, there's many ISIS prisoners that are at risk of escaping? Um, Laura, I'm I'm not aware of of anything. Um, well, attacks against the detention. Just an increased risk of some kind of breach or. The SDF guards having to. Yeah, I'd have to refer you to CENTCOM on that. I'm I'm not aware of anything specifically. Uh, as you highlight, I mean, this is sort of a, a U.S. SDF joint effort to um, to essentially ensure that Al Hall continues to to contain uh, ISIS prisoners. Uh, but I'd have to refer you to CENTCOM on that. And then on Ukraine, we talked about how the PDA, PDAs have are on pause right now. USAI uh, contracts continue to flow. How much longer will the U.S. be providing flowing air defense missiles to Ukraine? Um, so I don't, I don't have a number to provide for you. Um, you know, there are certain capabilities that were contract contracted under USAI, uh, which will continue, uh, which does include some air defense capabilities. We'll also continue to work very closely with allies and partners in terms of identifying Ukraine's needs and then working with them to, to help facilitate that process. So we're currently still flowing U.S. air defense missiles to Ukraine right now? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, that and, and other capabilities that we've announced as it relates to, to USAI. Jennifer. Just a follow-up, Pat. <coughs> you say that the person killed in Baghdad, the head of Kateb Hezbollah, was not a member of the PMF, but the Iraqi leaders say that he was. So how can you say he wasn't a member of the PMF if they say he was? And if you have targeted the head of Kateb Hezbollah in Iraq, does that mean you've determined that the drone that killed Americans in Jordan came from Iraq? Um, I don't have any updates to provide in terms of the point of origin for the drone uh, that, that struck Tower 22. Uh, and again, we're confident uh, that this individual uh, was, a Qatub, has, was a Qatub Hezbollah commander. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. I won't speak for the Iraqis. Yeah. Pat, last week uh, we heard from the Defense Secretary who said that Iran was ultimately to blame because they, they pay for these groups, these proxy groups, they bankroll these, these missiles and these uh, drones. So is it in his estimation that Iran has been held responsible for the attack at the Tower 22? Is it the Secretary's estimation? Um, again, look, we, we've said is that um, we will take necessary action to hold those accountable. Uh, those responsible for these attacks against our forces accountable. Um, I'm not going to uh, bound it other than to say that we will continue to stay focused on our mission in Iraq and Syria, as well as doing what we need to do to protect our forces. And I'll just leave it at that. Gordon. Pat, just to go back to this review thing, the Secretary's answer on how much would be uh, revealed or whatever was a bit shaky. The idea of, you know, who knew what when and who was supposed to say and do all that cannot be positively classified. So I'm trying to get a cleaner answer to how transparent the building will be on the results of this review because the idea that a lot of it is classified seems uh, not true. <laughs> I'm going to... Uh Take a deep breath there, Gordon. I, I know I understand and appreciate your skepticism there. Um, I'm telling you the truth and that there will be portions of that report that are classified and that we will work hard to provide you with as much information as we can, and you'll just have to take my word for it. Thank you. Sir. Um, 
just on the quickly on the Iraq strike, can you talk about <coughs> any timeline on when the president authorized mm -hmm. the strike uh, ahead of time? Um, how long before this was took place? And then can you talk about at what levels the discussions took place following the strike? You, got, you said you informed Iraq. Um, yeah. Just yeah. Just thanks, Joseph. Um, so I, you know, I'd refer you to the White House for any discussion on on the president. Um, not as I'm sure you can appreciate, I'm not going to get into discussions that, that the secretary has with the president in terms of timelines other than, um, you know, central command had the authorities that they needed uh, to conduct this strike. So and then on the call, the level of call from this building to the Iraqis after the strike? Um, I, I'd refer you to central command. I, I don't have anything to read out. I mean, as you know, we, we have forces in Iraq, uh, as well as a U.S. embassy presence, and so uh, we're communicating at multiple echelons. But I'd refer you to Central Just Command. On that. Gaza. Um, will is you know there's been talk about the Israelis have said they conduct a military operation in Tarafa. Um, does this department would this department support such an operation? And then secondly, on on that, um, at least two, maybe a third American have been detained by the Israeli military. Um, there's civilians that continue to be killed uh, in Palestine. The department has verbally said and warned that there needs to be a reduction in civilian casualties. Um, when or is the department prepared to do more than just issue verbal warnings? There's a lot of questions there, Joseph. <laughs> um, so in terms of, of Rafa, I, I don't have anything for you on that. I'd, I'd you know, refer you to the Israeli MOD to talk about their operations. Um, I think you know, um, NSC has talked about this uh, a bit. Um, clearly, you know, we continue to remain focused on ensuring that humanitarian assistance gets into Gaza. Um, and uh, there are concerns about making sure that um, civilian safety is taken into account um, if there were any operations to be considered in that in that area. But again, I don't, I don't have anything to provide on Israeli operations. As it relates to the detainment of any U.S. citizens, again, I'd, I'd refer you to State Department on that. I, I just don't have anything to provide. Okay. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, when it comes to addressing the threats of the Iranian-backed groups in Iraq and Syria, has your policy changed or shifted from deterrence to degrading these groups? Because one hour ago, the State Department and the BT spokesperson said that the focus continues to be on both on deterrence and also in degrading these groups. Has anything changed related to that? So I, I think you, you got to take a step back a little bit more from that and say, you know, the focus is on conducting the mission that we're there to do. And if we're attacked, taking appropriate action to deter future attacks as well as safeguarding our forces uh, to include holding those accountable who have been conducting these attacks. Part of that would include degrading the capabilities that they've been using to conduct attacks, right? So that's what you saw on Friday was uh, efforts to degrade the capabilities that they have, but also send a, a clear message uh, that we will take uh, action if our forces are attacked or threatened. So I totally understand that you are in Iraq on an invitation of the Iraqi government, and we spoke on that at different times. But when it comes to that, the Iraqi government says totally different what we are believing when it comes to the sovereignty. You say that we respect the Iraqi sovereignty and the Iraqi government, the spokesperson for the Iraqi government says that the U.S. is violating the Iraqi sovereignty. And also today what they announced that these attacks compels the Iraqi government more than ever to terminate the mission of the coalition. Does that concern you at all, these comments that coming from the Iraqi government? I understand that you are not speaking for the Iraqi government, but does that, are you taking these comment statements seriously? Well, look, we take our relationship with Iraq seriously, and we value them as a partner. We do respect their sovereignty. But again, uh, when our forces are attacked or threatened, it's incumbent on us to take necessary action to protect those forces. Uh, and so um, I'll just leave it at that. May I add the last one? Is, I there, some of your colleagues here. is there any agreement between you and the Iraqi government? <coughs> uh, have you told the Iraqi government if you like it or don't, if our force has been attacked by any groups inside Iraq, we will respond them without not pre-notification to your government? Uh, so I, as I mentioned, uh, we have been and have had conversations with our Iraqi partners uh, that we, uh, both publicly and privately, uh, that we will respond to any attacks 
against our forces. And of course, part of those conversations include working with the Iraqi government to request their assistance in protecting our forces that are there at their invitation. Uh, and so again, in, in some cases we have seen ISF forces doing that. Uh, but you know, as you, as you have all highlighted and as we've discussed, um, you know, when our forces are threatened over 160 times and you know, after three US service members are killed, multiple wounded, um, you know, we're going to take appropriate action. Let me go to the phone here, Idris from Reuters. Hey there, Pat. Um, when did the secretary last speak with the Iraqi prime minister? I think it's been a few months at least. And is the lack of uh, sort of uh, conversations and phone calls with him a sign that the secretary feels that the prime minister is uh, sort of helpless in stopping the attacks against U.S. troops? And secondly, you mentioned um, that about 100 uh, missile launchers have been destroyed or degraded. What do you mean by degraded? Does that mean that they're sort of damaged beyond use? Or, or could you describe that phrase? Yeah, thanks, Idris. Um, well, I'll have to take the question on when the last call was. I want to say it was December time frame um, with um, the, the prime minister. But um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm not going to speak uh, for him uh, and, and, you know, how he feels about things. Uh, finally, in terms of degraded, uh, yes, you know, functionally uh, incapable of, of operating or, or being employed as intended. Thank you. Come back to the room here, sir. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, I'm going to come back to the HMC discussions. Today, uh, the spokesperson for Iraqi Armed Forces said this Sunday the negotiations will start again. And he said uh, when all the topics is to phase out withdrawal of the U.S. and alliance forces, does this contradict what you have said before? Uh, look, first of all, I'm not going to hold the meeting here. Uh, that's what we have meetings and discussions for. And as you heard us talk about, the, the purpose of the Higher Military Commission, which was agreed upon back in August, was to discuss uh, the phasing of the, uh, or the transition of the military forces as part of the coalition uh, to a longer term bilateral U.S.-Iraq security cooperation. Uh, so, you know, again, what that looks like uh, is exactly what those meetings will be all about and, and discuss. You know, the important thing here is I think we all agree uh, that a secure and stable I Iraq is important to the region, and so the United States is committed to working with our Iraqi partners toward that end. I may ask, uh, do your forces in Iraq have any role in conducting uh, air strikes or only CENTCOM has? The forces in Iraq are there to support the train and advise mission for the defeat ISIS mission at the invitation of the government of Iraq. Jared. Sir, on uh, I believe it was the evening of February 4th, I could be incorrect, but uh, there was a suspected uh, militia drone attack on uh, near the uh, Green Village base in Syria in which uh, Syrian Democratic Forces members were killed. Uh, is that the first time uh, suspected Iran-backed militias have targeted uh, the SDF uh, with drones, and does the department see that as potentially indicative of a shift in tactics by these groups? Uh, so, Jared, I, I don't have the answer to that question. You'd have to talk to the, the SDF. Uh, as I, you know, uh, my, my assessment based on, you know, my read, what I saw was that that drone was probably intended for Green Village uh, and, you know, landed several kilometers away from Green Village. So whether or not they were intentionally targeting SDF, I don't know. Um, so just have to leave it there. Thanks. Yeah. Um, two questions. So first, uh, in terms of all the strikes against the Houthis uh, equipment and, and different sites, have there been any Houthi casualties? And then uh, Arnett Erding's call today, the mayor CEO said that the U.S. Navy can't guarantee the safety of passage in the Red Sea. Does the Pentagon agree with that? Is this Red Sea safe for commercial shipping right now? So on your first question, um, I don't have any uh, I, I don't have any information to provide in terms of specific numbers. I think it is a safe bet to assume that Houth there are some Houthi militants that have been killed as a result of the strikes that we've conducted. I just don't have any numbers to provide for you. Again, our focus is in, on eliminating capabilities that they've been employing or using to uh, conduct these attacks. Um, and then in terms of the Red Sea, you know, look, this is why you have a coalition of over 20 countries working to help safeguard uh, this vital waterway. It's a defensive coalition uh, that is conducting joint patrols and providing capability to help vessels that transit. At the end of the day, it's up to commercial industry whether they 
opt to go through that route. Uh, obviously, I think it's in the international interest to ensure that it is safe uh, and secure, and that's why we're working so hard toward that end. Let me go back out to the phone here. Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Thank you. Um, the Pentagon has provided an update of how many service members have been injured in Iraq and Syria. Could we get the number of those um, diagnosed with mild traumatic brain injury? I know it's been asked before, and understandably, other things have happened, but uh, an update on the TBIs would be most welcome. Also, uh, back in January, there were some tweets that the uh, Houthis, with their F-5, uh, fooled around and found out, and that their F-5 was shot down. Uh, can the DOD talk about that at all? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. On your on your first question, uh, we'll take that. Uh, as you know, th those numbers can fluctuate, uh, but we'll take that question. On the the latter question, I don't have anything to provide for you beyond what I've what I've read out in my topper and in, in the previous uh, briefings in terms of BDA at this stage. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Pat. Um, other than the first time it was announced about the Ukraine contact group, and every time you mention a new co one coming up. You've always said, and more than 50 nations will participate. In your opening remarks today, you said nearly 50 nations. Why the drop-off in support? Uh, so I, I don't think there's been a drop-off in support, and I'd, I'd ask you to go back and look at the various statements because I, I would submit that, you know, sometimes it's nearly 50, sometimes it's more than I 50. I you might say that, and I did look before okay, I asked the question. Okay, great. So it was a setup. Excellent. <laughs> Good to know. All right. Anything else I can do to entertain you? You've done a great job so far. Thanks. Perfect. All right, let me go to Howard Altman, Warzone. Hey, thanks, Pat. Um, can you provide any more details about how the drone that got through Tower 22 in Jordan, how that happened? Was it a lack of air defenses? Um, can you provide more details? Yeah, thanks, Howard. So um, what I can tell you right now is that U.S. Central Command is investigating the attack on Tower 22. Uh, and so at this stage, uh, it would be inappropriate for me to comment or speculate on on the specifics of that. Uh, U.S. Army Central Command has the lead for that investigation. Uh, and so, um, you know, they'll, they'll be doing that work. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, once that investigation is complete, we may have more information to provide. Uh, but right now, I'm, I'm just not able to go into those details. Thank you. Come back in the room, sir. Uh, is there any indication that North Korea prepare conduct military action against South Korea? That North Korea is preparing to military action against South Korea. Uh, I I don't have any uh, intelligence to pass along. Um, you know, so basically, you know, again, we're going to continue to monitor the situation. I'm not aware of any imminent uh, attacks, um, but we're going to continue to work closely with South Korea and Japan to monitor the. The region and work towards security and stability. One more. So, do you know any information that what kind of a weapon or technology North Korea received from Russia in return for their providing ammunition and missile to Russia? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? So, what kind of a weapon or technology North Korea received from Russia in return for their providing ammunition to missiles to Russia? Um, I, I don't have any specifics to pass along. As you highlight, there there is a relationship there, um, and we do know that that North Korea has provided uh, capabilities to Russia. Uh, you know, hoping to to build up a relationship to be able to capitalize on on Russian uh, capabilities. Uh, but I'll just leave it at, at that. Let me go to Fadi, and then I'll come to you. So, so General, uh, after the uh, uh, attack on U.S. forces in Jordan, the Pentagon said the response will be multi-tiered. So far, we've seen um, twice, two waves at least, uh, the one in Iraq and Syria and now with, uh, in, in Baghdad. Um, is this approach uh, um, is still valid, or does the Pentagon think that the response to the attack in Jordan has played out, and now it depends on whether attacks continue on U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria? Yeah, thanks, Fadi. I mean, as, again, just uh, to emphasize what I said earlier, uh, the, the strike on Friday and the strike yesterday uh, was conducted in response to those attacks, uh, as well as the attacks on U.S. forces, uh, and meant to hold those responsible accountable. As for whether or not there will be future attacks, again, I'm, I'm just not going to uh, speculate or talk about potential future operations, other than to say, again, we'll take necessary action to protect our forces. And I'll just leave it there. Mike. 
Okay, time Thanks. for a couple more. Thanks, Pat. Uh, today, General Maslum of the SDF accused Turkey of uh, attacking civil their civilian infrastructure, including oil facilities. Uh, can you confirm if, if that's true or not? And does that cause any does it cause any uh, problems for the campaign to have two allies fighting each other instead of ISIS? Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I, I don't have any information on that. I haven't, I haven't seen those reports. Doesn't mean it hasn't happened. I just haven't seen anything on it. Um, and as for political campaigns, uh, that, that's just not something that I'm going to comment on. Last question, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Two questions. Uh, one, China was in the news last week and this week in the media and also on the Capitol Hill that as far as cybersecurity or other concerns are uh, Chinese have so many people here uh, against the United States. My question is, how much concern is from Pentagon here as far as Chinese uh, cyber and military security is concerned within the U.S.? Yeah, well, without going into specific uh, instances, uh, what I would tell you is, as we've highlighted many times before, China continues to remain our pacing challenge. Uh, and as we've highlighted in our national defense strategy, one aspect of that is uh, operations in cyberspace. And so, again, we'll continue to take that very seriously. Uh, and it's something that we'll continue to work on closely with allies and partners as it relates to their own cybersecurity. And, and then you had a second sir. question. As far as uh, this war in the Middle East is concerned and ter terrorist activities against many countries in the Middle East, there are many terrorists in many countries there. My question is that they are digging, they have had 1,300 or 1,500 tunnels, they have arms, they have financing. My question is, are we going after those who are financing them millions and millions of dollars and giving them arms and uh, supporting them? And when, I'm sorry, which terrorist group? Uh, in the Middle East, like uh, Hamas or uh, Hezbollah and others. Yeah. So. Uh Without getting into a specific breakdown of, of various terrorist groups, and you know, happy to have an offline discussion with you on that. I, I, as you know, as part of our national defense strategy, uh, counterterrorism is an aspect of that. Right? We acknowledge that that there is a significant terrorist threats around the world, um, and we will continue to work with our allies and partners towards addressing that, to include those that affect our our homeland, uh, and so. Um, it's something we obviously take very seriously. It's something, oh, by the way, that we got very good at after 20 years of conducting counterterrorism operations, um, but also recognizing the, 